Hello, hello. Welcome into the PHNX Rising podcast. I'm Owen Evans, joined again today by Jake Anderson, who is uh, coming in from his bedroom, looking a little bit more dapper than you did on the weekend there, Jake. Just a tad. I, uh, I didn't put a tie on for you, though. You didn't so put a tie again. on. You didn't put a tie matching. on. Mm, well, the chat might have to say something about that later on. But yeah, Jake, joining again today, we've got quite a lot to get through. We're going to talk about what happened on the weekend. We're going to talk more importantly about the new signing that Rising brought in and quite what that might mean for this team going forward. And we'll take a little bit of a look around the league as well and maybe outside of the league in addition as well. So let's kick things off. Let's talk a little bit more about the weekend. Now, we we had a lot of conversation after the game about where we thought things went wrong, about how bad they were at times against Pittsburgh River Hounds. It wasn't a great game. Jake, have your views changed at all since the final whistle? No, not really. I mean, maybe looking back at how many shots they did take, uh, going back to when against Vegas, it seemed like they weren't taking shots, period. So it seems like now they're less afraid to take those shots from distance. But again, it, it goes back to what we talked about Saturday night. The shots don't necessarily reflect how dangerous or the lack of danger that they created. Although they did, they did test the keeper twice, uh, but that's still not enough. Yeah. Yeah. It was not great at all. I mean, again, it was four shots on target and just, yeah. I mean, one in the first half, that was the effort from Manuel Artiaga, that looping header. You three in the second half, two of which are from Eddie Manjoma. Uh, but overall, just, yeah, Rising didn't feel like threatening. In fact, there's, there's one thing, actually, I'll take this from the last game. We'll look at Rising's kind of passing, their crossing from that last game. And the first half in particular, we, we've done this before. We've pulled these kind of this graphic up and we've looked at how Rising have been in terms of their build-up play in the first half of a game. When you look at it this time, again, it feels like, as this goes from right to left, so Rising defending that goal to the right, attacking the goal to the left, you can see just how little they're putting into the penalty area in terms of successful passes or crosses. It, it, it's literally none. Like, they, they didn't, they didn't <laughs> yeah, complete... See, oh, what, maybe two or three in there? And there's so many passes, though, in general. It's such a cluster everywhere else. Yeah, and we it, it goes back to the... I don't want to call it pointless possession, but there, there is times where they have the ball for, you know, 15, 20, 25 passes, but they don't create a chance off of it. So it's kind of like, well, what did you just hold the ball for two, three minutes for anyway? But I, I think it, I think it illustrates perfectly, literally that the crosses that they do play, I would almost want to see a graphic of the opposite of shows the, the passes that they tried in the box or the passes that they tried that were intercepted or defenders got their head on to, because I could just off of memory think of a few that happened in the box where they just don't get on the end of those crosses. But nothing's nothing, it just goes with what we said at the beginning. Uh, the chances that they're creating aren't necessarily dangerous, other than when, you know, Eddie's shooting, you know, pretty decently from right around the edge of the 18. Yeah, I mean, it's look, if you can't work the ball for the most part into the penalty area, you're not going to score many goals. You're just not. You can't live and die by that long shot and just hope that some of them are going to go in. And from Rising's perspective, again, two of the better opportunities they had, it was Eddie Manjoma. He forced some really good saves out of the opposition goalkeeper. But they weren't good opportunities. He actually did very well with what was, you know, perhaps even more of a half chance. You look at Manuel Artiagas, I feel as though, look, did it necessarily threaten the goalkeeper that much? No, it didn't. But again, he was making the most of, of what was handed to him pretty much. And it wasn't very much that was handed to him. So there's a lot of different parts to this that just aren't quite clicking for whatever reason. Now, one thing that we did see, there was a slightly different kind of tactical plan almost it felt at times between how... We've expected Rising to go in and attack um, in recent games. This is what we saw in that last game. Let's have a look, a look at the, the positions, actually, the average positions. This is from the entirety of the game. To me, this is an interesting one because when you look at it now, we've we've gotten very used to Rising kind of attacking. You have the center forward there. It's your number nine. It's Manuel Artiaga. You have those two attacking midfielders. It's normally Danny Trejo, someone else, even Ferry Varela, Carlos Harvey. 
And yet here what you see, and this is the interesting bit to me, is that your number nine, Arteaga, is leading the line, as you'd expect. You've got Danny Trejo right behind him. And then really the other attack is coming from out wide. But when you look at Jose Andres Hernandez and Carlos Harvey, who one of those you would imagine should normally be the attacking midfielder, they're actually both deeper. They're pretty similar in their positioning. Yeah. And so that changes the game, doesn't it, a little bit? Because those two fullbacks, I think they, in the attack, they're further up the field. The reason that they look so far back is because obviously they drop back quite a way to defend as well. Yeah. Um, So you're kind of attacking with those four. You've then got Jose Andres Hernandez and Carlos Harvey. You're not quite sure who's going to be that second attacking midfielder. Um, Maybe it's because they're alternating at times. Maybe they're just not getting as advanced. Um. Uh, and yeah, it's it's a little bit different, I think, than what we've seen before. I think the biggest thing it tells me is that, and it's if we go side by side with that crossing map, it really shows me that because the options in the box a weren't working or just weren't played, even the cutback option to the top of the box, twenty five yards out, even if you don't get a shot off, you can swing the ball across force the defense to shift over, which then creates space that was just left from where you just were, because you can go right back to the left if, if need be. And I think if you don't have that supporting, it's honestly a supporting midfielder at that point in the attack, because you either take the shot at the top of the box or you can you can literally just be like a perfect, you ha- you're in the center of the pitch. You can play it left, right, take the momentum away. We know that they're trying to play the diagonal ball and cut it back to again get get that tap and get that center ball that then gets hit in but yeah the, the a the combination of the fact that you had zero zero uh completed crosses around the penalty area is is dreadful like you're 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 really really struggling if that's the case and the positioning of the midfielders especially when we're expecting Carlos Harvey or or Fernandez to to be there in support I mean, the, the seeing the stats like this after watching the game, it 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 kind of it, it's it's more eye opening and it more hits home the fact that the attack is not necessarily penetrating the other team's defense. Well, that's that's almost the problem. I think we've seen that throughout this, whereby and look, I, I don't want to try and cast shade on what Juan's trying to do overall. Um, I think the idea of Rising playing a possession-based style is not something that I am particularly opposed to. Um, I said it on Twitter the other day that when you actually watch a possession-based style, if it's carried out effectively, it can be one of the most exciting and enjoyable styles of football to, to watch and to consume. The problem is that conversely, when it gets caught, when there are still things that are missing, it can be incredibly frustrating to watch because you get into moments where I know this came up on uh, on Twitter a little bit as well. People were talking about it. you look at the end of the first half and it's just sluggish. And a lot of the times rising can be quite sluggish. Um, and even when they get into the final third, then they're trying to, to find opportunities. They're trying to break through that defense, but you're trying to pass it through six or seven people yeah. who are defending at least. Um, and that's not easy. There's not space there. And so you end up playing it from side to side outside. Now, I think that they have been trying to work on the crossing. I'm still not convinced that it's there, um, that it's where it needs to be. I know they've been trying to work on it. Um, but it's it's concerning, I think, that, again, this is a time when Rising, broadly speaking, is getting back to full fitness. They're getting back to a position where a lot of their players who've been out injured are starting to come back. We saw Gallardo come back. We've seen Gabby Torres is very much on the brink of coming back. Uzo is back. These are guys who are pretty important to this team. I mean, Emil Cuejo isn't yet back. Um, he's, but, he's one that they need back. He's one that they need back. But I mean, we're, we're about to speak about the new signing and we're going to have to talk, I think, about quite where these guys fit in um, at that point. But when you have all of those players coming back now and you think, okay, this squad is getting closer to full fitness, you then really just have to wonder, okay, how much longer can this team take to click before it starts to become a concern or beyond a concern even? Because I think we're concerned now that there are still elements missing in this attack. That to me is the question. How much longer 
does Rising really have until this has to be fixed? Well, I, I think in part of that, my question, and I would love to ask Juan about this on when we see him on Wednesday, why is it taking so long in the match for it to get going? Like, I, I understand you're not going to be able to penetrate a team for 90 straight minutes. You're going to have to play defense as well. But it's I could I could just bet twenty minutes in how many shots is Phoenix Rising gonna have? Like how? Yeah, I, it, it, it's it, not it, gonna be that many, no. And they're not getting they're not getting truly dangerous until the second half. It's almost like they're. I don't I don't want to speculate that they're that they're that Juan's waiting to see how the teams are gonna play against them, and then they're making halftime substitutions. But why isn't the aggression? the assertiveness, the willing to play the risky ball, willing to play that that chance in the first half. Because, because that'll help. Yeah, that helps I mean, with the possession-based style. Like, what is the worst case if you turn the ball over in the other team's box? Like, what is what? Like, it's, it's hard to get countered if you turn the ball over in the other team's box. And when you start to do those sideways passes across the box, and not even in the box, but just along the top of it, and you're not firing or you're not playing the ball over the top, you're not playing it in between the lines, that's when I get frustrated. That's when I think Juan's getting frustrated because that's when it becomes pointless possession. You're in the other team's third, but you're not even pressing to get to the final because you're almost looking for that perfect ball. But to answer the question of being concerned, I mean, I think it's I think it's pretty forward. We are concerned because this, this is – this over the next – two months if this doesn't pick up the season's pretty much lost and then you're going to have to play another two months of just what like kind of what are we doing bottom of the table which is what we kind of went through last year however long as people wanted to claim that they were still in the playoff race how 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 long did you actually feel rising was going to be in it i i don't want a repeat of last year i think the season is still it's not over but it's salvageable you can still be a top half of the table team you can still host a playoff game this year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you definitely can at this point. I know you touched on it. Some of the people in the chat touching on it now as well. Look, this team does have to come out and just be more aggressive from the start. When you're playing a possession-based style, if you can get that early goal or two, you're going to force the opponent to actually come out and do something, which opens up spaces for you to pass through even. The opponent can't afford to just sit back and bunker in at the back. They're going to have to actually come out and play a more aggressive style against you. They're going to have to take more risks, and it's going to open up spaces that you can try and play through that are going to create more chances again for guys like Arteaga, for guys like Trejo, uh, to, to kind of get themselves into space and for you to be able to play them in. But the problem is, because it's quite so slow and Ultimately, a lot of these teams, look, it's USL. A lot of teams, if you let them hang around in a game, no matter how good or bad they are, they will find a goal. It may not be good. It may not be particularly be uh, well worked. I mean, look at Vegas. They had one shot exactly. on target. You look at Pittsburgh. They get a set piece. They do it. They do it in the first half. At the end of the day, when you let these teams take those kind of leads... Then, then you're the ones up against it. And what you see is sometimes more frantic, I guess, even in the second half and late in the game, where Rising has been playing this possession-based style this entire time. It's slower. Um, it's more methodical, perhaps. And yet, at that time in the game, when you desperately need something, you've just got to turn it up. And they can't seem to find a breakthrough at that point. Look, they, they just need to actually start a game on the front foot, which... We, we've seen maybe a couple of times so far this season, but we haven't seen it consistently enough. No, and I, and I think the reason why you do see the frantic level of play late matches is because you know the clock's ticking. Like, you're running out of time, and you need to score. Whereas in the beginning of the match, you're, you're willing to be more patient, which I guess could be a strategic, but at this point, Again, I, I'm gonna. It's, I'm hitting it on the head again, but it's just kind of why are we? Is the team not willing to play a dangerous ball? And I don't mean dangerous in your defense. I mean play the risky pass. You might turn it over, but you might not. You have to force a defender to play it out. It could be a corner. You could get fouled for a penalty. Get the ball in the box. If you're not, how do are most rebounds come? It's from close distance shots. Is it a header? Is it a shot from an angle? 
and it's and it's parried right back into the, the opposite winger, and he can bury it home. Rising isn't even giving themselves the opportunity to get those chances because every shot is coming from 15 to 20 yards or more. I mean, how, how many how many set pieces are are they giving themselves an opportunity to have a redirect? It's the hardest hardest thing to guard for a goalkeeper. Or the hardest shot to block for goalkeepers are redirected. We saw a few hit the wall. I mean, that's that's doing nobody any favors at that point. You're not giving yourself a chance. I think that's the the biggest thing. I think Rising is holding themselves back from giving themselves opportunity. If if that makes sense, like they're they're like you can't make a shot that you don't take. Like it, it you you got to you got to play a risky pass every now and again. You do, you do. You've got to make sure that you take your chances. You really, really do. But look, when you're thinking about it from Rising's perspective now, we're going to touch on it in a minute with with Pano signing, but is it a player issue at this point? Is it a tactic issue? Is it, we're quite, is it a combination of them all, I think, perhaps, at times? Yeah, I mean, I, I, we were speaking uh, after the match Saturday. I, I'll, I'll give Juan half an out. The team is not fully there. It is not at full fitness. But I do think it's 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 time to start changing some things up. You don't have to do a complete tactical revamp. You can keep the main core. Maybe you'll give up 5% possession to give yourself three or four more opportunities throughout 90 minutes. You can maybe take some guys like Danny Trejo, put him out wide, maybe change the formation up slightly. Because we even said... he. You're playing a th- the three-five system, which your wing backs then become the five as well. They're going up and down in a in a four-three-three. That six, that holding midfielder, can stay, and the wing backs can still go up. And essentially, you have the same exact system defensively and then offensively because right now they don't utilize Danny Trejo out wide, which I think he's more he's better utilized in space. You can get him out wide, get him in space. I said last week, or I said on Saturday, 5'9 Danny Trejo is not the guy who should be in the center of the box trying to head a ball in. He should be the guy taking guys one-on-one v one, creating space for others. And then that that midfielder, that supporting midfielder comes in. He could play a one-two with him. You can do the cutback if you take it to the end line. You're giving yourself more opportunity to be in the box, play balls in the box. I, and I think if 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 you can just change, because what you're doing now is not not doing that. So if you continue to do it, I, I think it would just be foolish to think that it's plan A is going to work when it's clearly not working. Indeed, indeed. Well, we'll have to see if Rising does indeed come up with that kind of a plan B as they come home for their next game. Of course, the last home game, Jake, I'm not sure if you saw, they were handing out Circle K gas cards at that game, actually. Um, so for those of you in the chat, if you've picked any up, uh, 10 cents off a gallon, that's through August. And uh, those gas prices are starting to come down. While you're there, don't forget as well, you can pick yourself up a Polar Pop. And if you're going to do so, make sure to go ahead, text PHNX to 31310 to join their SMS subscriber club. That'll give you a buy one, get one free Polar Pop, 32 ounce Polar Pop. So make sure you don't miss out on that. Again, you get your cheaper gas, you can get a free Polar Pop. Make sure to head to circlek.com slash store dash locator, circlek.com slash store dash locator to find Circle K's near you. And of course, you may need it if the Rising come out and play again like they did against Pittsburgh. Make sure to enjoy the game with a four peaks. I've got the kilt lifter here. Jake, uh, any particular four peaks that you are uh, a fan of or no? Uh, You know me, I don't drink beer. He's not a big beer guy, to be fair, but I'm sure, I'm sure if you were going to, you go with the there, Four Peaks. If, if, if there was a rum and coke version of Four Peaks, <laughs> I'd probably drink it. Be sure to follow them on social at Four Peaks Brew and at Four Peaks Pub. Remember, you can go ahead on down to the 8th Street location as well as where we had our World Cup watch parties. Good time there. And remember, you must be 21 years or older to enjoy Four Peaks. Now then... Let's talk. It's about what we've headlined this. We should talk about the new midfielder. We should talk about him. Panos Ar- Armanakos. Uh, have I got him right? Yeah, I think I got that one right, didn't I? I'm getting used to the new name here. God, there's a lot of new names this year that we take to remember. But Panos, a guy coming in, big chance creator. He is 
someone who was very highly touted when he was young. Now, I think that's something that you've always got to take with a pinch of salt. I think those kind of guys who get listed for those things like the the next gen top 50 and all of that, a lot of it becomes like your technical ability and not necessarily how you grow from that. You're expected to grow from that point as a 16 year old. And I, I, I'm just intrigued now how he does, because he's been a journeyman for a while now. Now he did manage to get a good number of games in Denmark. He's come over to USL. He started the year pretty well with a fairly mediocre Loudoun United side as Loudoun almost always are. Um, but I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued how he's going to come in with teammates that on paper should be a lot better than what he's been playing with earlier in the year. So his history tells me a couple of things. One, it tells me he received proper coaching at a young age, which I think allows you to have sustained success at a certain level. You may not reach the level that, you know, the, I think it was the Guardian said he was a top 50 player, a young player at one point. He may not ever reach those levels, but I think there is a floor he can maintain. But then the second aspect of that, and we've kind of seen it in his uh, press release quotes, is he's very confident in his ability. And I think that added little spark, a new place, a new challenge, the fact that he knows he's coming to a team that he has better teammates. Again, we only saw him for 10 minutes, so there's not much to judge. But I think there is potential there to where – he might actually be able to be the key that unlocks the door. He might be able to connect guys once he starts to understand how his teammates play off of him, get him on the ball, let's see what he can do as what I'm assuming is going to be that attacking midfielder that they don't play the, the traditional number 10 role, but essentially that that position. I, I think there's there's a chance here that this could be a missing ingredient, a missing piece that at least Juan's been looking for because I don't know he he he's not going to play a, a big target man that's not going to be the style but I do think if he plays almost that second striker role just behind I mean hell he could be that supporting midfielder that we were just talking about who then can also play off a diagonal I mean if you can just get him on the ball I think he'll be able to do a lot almost what we thought Fede was going to be able to do this year yeah and Fede's been a little bit sluggish but you know, you mentioned earlier about about Panos and what he's said um, in interviews. I'll, I'll read out the quote here. This one uh, with USL's Nicholas Murray said, "To be honest, and this may sound a bit weird for someone who's come from overseas, but I believe I'm the best player in the USL Championship, and it will take a lot for me to not believe that. I think I've seen quite a few games in the league, and I've come up against quite a few opponents already, and I don't think there's someone better in the league that does what I do." What do you think about that, Jake? Because that's that's a statement. This guy says this in the start of May. Has he okay? played in the eleven? Did Has he, he meet, played in the eleven? Has he played did against Solomon Asante? Did he meet Solomon um, Asante? Ooh, there's a good question. Had they played them at that point? I don't actually know. But even I've if he did, does he know who Solo is? You know what? They had indeed played in the eleven a handful of days prior with Solomon Asante playing in that game. But Panos only came off the bench in that game. And in D1. So. And, and again, I, there's no way... I, I mean, I, I would doubt that he knew what Solo has done in this league anyway. You know? I mean, he, he, he's just... I think, look, we, we've spoken about this many a time between ourselves. Just like... Especially as you look now and you look back on this team and what they are now versus what they used to be. And you think about it and you think just how critical Solo was in this team in a lot of ways. Even when he wasn't at his best, he was still enough that he scared the opposition defenders just that, just enough that it opened up space for others. But yeah, that was... He won an MVP yeah. on a down year. Yeah, he did. We, we were all camera. commenting that he was not at his best that year and he still won the MVP. I mean, just to be in that conversation, that breath. I mean, we were talking. I mean, he might be the greatest player in league history. It for what he did, the the amount of goals that were created, not just scored, but created off of him, and you know, it goes back to that. He created chances because he could take a guy on one v one, whatever he wanted, and it only takes beating one guy to create space for another teammate. And that's all you really need to do because you'll find each other in space. That's the e that's easy. That's what makes the game fun. 
it's creating the space and you have to have the movement. You have to have defenders get beat in order to do it. And he did that. And I think that's what this team is missing right now. You don't, you don't have anyone who's able to just take someone on, create space for one guy, get it to him. That creates space for the next guy. Put two or three passes in the box together and put it in the back of the net. Because right, so, well, <laughs> so, think about it. Solo is the shortest guy he I is. think this league has he ever is. seen, and he dominated it. <laughs> so it's not like he was a big, powerful forward. No, no, not in the slightest. <laughs> you know, I mean, even when he was punching balls in the net. <laughs> uh, memories of that Sacramento playoff game. But, you know, to get back on track with Panos, though, I did actually hear a little bit from Juan about Panos after the game on Saturday. Let's have a listen to that. It's not easy, right? It's not easy for the kid to receive a phone call on Thursday very late at night that's saying that he's been traded. And now then he comes to us. And, yeah, I mean, he, he adapted very quickly. We spent together a day and a half. He was part of the training session the other day. And he fits He fits our game model. He fits our style of play. Um, it's going to take some time for, for him to start getting used to his, his teammates, his new teammates. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a player that, that we scouted. We also knew him from the offseason. And he just needs minutes. He needs minutes with players. And we finish with a very offensive-minded team on the field, which is also a positive that I take from tonight, which is how we can add, you know I mean, the Trejos, the Panos, the Gallardos, the Fedes, and all of them can play together on the field at once. And that's very important. And then you also see the bench today, right? You still have Uso, right? You still have uh, Carlitos and Guiano. You have, you know I mean, guys, Gabi. Gabi's coming back, and, and he stayed out of the 18 just because he's not there yet, but he's going to come back. We're getting strong. We're getting strong, and and again, I'm I'm not worried about tonight. Of course, I don't like the result. Nobody likes to lose. But if we keep this up and we play like this 20 plus more times, we're gonna be okay. So here's the thing: you can you can break that down kind of into the two. There's Juan says that he thinks that Panos is gonna fit their their gameplay quite well. He'll fit the the game model quite well and the planning that he's coming out with. He also, of course, mentions all of those guys who are coming back. The fact that when you look at Rising's bench, it is looking a lot better than it did at times over the last month, whereby that bench was looking a lot sparser, a lot more full of, at times, academy players um, because they were struggling with injuries. But that in itself, of course, is going to create a problem because we're going to see increasingly now, when you look, Danny Trejo... You've got Panos, Fede, and when he comes back from injury, Emil Quasio. Those guys coexisting in that kind of position, that's going to be tough. Yeah. It, it, in the current system, I don't see how they can all play consistently. It, it, which is why I, I kind of think that they, that they could really utilize having two out having two wingers and I don't mean wing backs I mean two forward wingers and then your striker because I, I don't see how those four can fill up what two positions pretty I mean, much and that, yeah and that's and that's asking that's I mean they're, they're not in the open cup so the depth there doesn't matter it you're you're going to lose we think we, we presume where you're going to lose Harvey and, and Kev, but Kev's not playing in the midfield anymore. So that you might have a more attacking lineup, but you won't have the, the fact that Carlos is a box to box guy. He's going to give you on both offense and defense. You're going to lose that if you put one of those in and you go, but it, that might be the change. That might be the change. He's that, that, that triangle mm -hmm. in the middle, instead of being, you know, the the six with the two that go up and down, it might just be a six who doesn't go up and they, the two have more freedom to go up and almost like a double tens at, at, at times. That could could potentially work because you could then create a triangle with one of the tens, the number nine, and the winger. And then on the other side, you have another triangle. Then you have a, the third triangle in the middle and you create three across the forward front, which I think could be deadly if, if everyone's clicking. There's an idea. Uh, I, we don't know what Juan's thinking. He's not going to tell us until they're actually playing. But it, it does bring up an interesting conversation because 
first you have to get to fitness. Now you're at fitness. Now you have to prove it in training that you're in form. Then you have to take it to the pitch. And that's an entirely different thing. And I, there's, there's no way if one guy is struggling, his confidence is going to get better because he's going to be in and out of the lineup. And we all know with footballers that if your confidence is down, you're you're not going to be. Especially with attack-minded players. Attack-minded players who are going to have to take risks, be yeah. it taking shots on, be it playing risky balls through that may or may not find a teammate. Confidence is incredibly important to those kind of guys. Look at Santi last year. Santi was dreadful. I, that was the worst he, I've ever <laughs> there's seen no, him. There's in. no other way of describing him last year, is there? It was... But, it was and, like he had a fantastic season and just fell off a cliff. Yeah, and, and you could you could tell. You could tell the confidence wasn't there. It it because it, it's hard to be confident when you're not playing well or when you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Like at least when it was I think it was 2021, Santi in this particular example was getting unlucky. He had he had, had multiple posts. Like he he couldn't break that barrier, but he was there. And that goes to what Juan always talks about with the process and trusting the process, not necessarily a result. That I could get behind in that particular circumstance. Santi last year, this team right now, the attack. There isn't something there that tells me, okay, you're you're shooting it at the keeper. You you got unlucky and hit the post. It's I don't think most of your shots are going in when they leave your foot. Yeah. And that's where it then gets into the intriguing part, right? Because we hear from Juan about, we played this in the post-game show, we hear him saying, well, actually, we did a lot of things well. And you get into that question then of how much of it is necessarily just trying to build up some of the boys' confidence, trying to take some of the smaller victories rather than ripping into them in a case like that for what we didn't perceive as a particularly great performance in the attack. And... I understand that. I understand I need to do it. But then it gets into where's the balance, right? Where's the balance between trying to work incredibly hard to boost the confidence while also acknowledging sometimes certain things just aren't good enough. And that's something where, look, I, I hesitate, hesitate to bring this one up because it's a comparison that I don't think anyone wants. And it's not one that I think on the whole, on the big picture, is a particularly fair comparison to make. But I think in this one minutia, the, the little like, very narrow area of what I'm talking about here probably is relatively accurate. And that's that when you listen to that clip back, it had feelings at times of some of what we heard when things started going hill, downhill last year. And that was at times early work going downhill, of course, the insistence that actually things weren't that bad. Even when you feel as though most people watching it can say, this doesn't look great. Are you talking about with Juan or with Rick? With with Rick. <laughs> the early stages of that, exactly. at least, last year. So take, for example, the LA Galaxy game where the team, I thought, were awful. Most of the fans thought the team were awful. Rick comes out a couple of days later and says, actually, we weren't that bad. And it's one of those things whereby when you come out with those kind of defenses and say things are okay, even if the average person, whether they... Whether they know everything or not, um, and that's that's a fair point as well. The average fan doesn't know everything. We don't know everything either. Um, but you'll come out with a defense sometimes and everyone just thinks, that's not what I watched. Um, it doesn't always help. Sometimes it actually does the opposite. Sometimes the the message you're giving to the outside world, it just makes them angrier at times. And that that's an awkward thing to try and control at that point. Yeah, I, I think I remember what you're talking about. We, I don't remember how the phrasing of the questions were, but it was, you played poorly. I, and he says, I don't, I don't agree, or what makes you think that? And you were like, you lost 3-0. Something to that effect. And it's like, the score doesn't reflect how we played. And it was like, you, you got beat pretty handedly at home. Like, it, 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 that shouldn't happen against this yeah. team. I think Juan's best... At least when he's talking to us in a press conference, he's very level-headed. He doesn't get too high. He doesn't get too low. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that's that's very on, on point. I think he tried to fire up his team by what he said to us after Vegas, saying it was an embarrassment, saying that he was sorry to the fans. And he was right. You gave a team their first victory of the entire season, what, 11 weeks in on your home pitch? That shouldn't happen. And now, as you said on, on Saturday, if you would have said – Five weeks ago, yeah, 
they're going to lose one nil in Pittsburgh. You probably would have said, yeah, that, 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 that sounds about right. It's probably Pittsburgh's not, not a bad team. They're very good at home. But the fact that it was, it was coming off of the performance against Vegas, which came off of a not so impressive performance, but you still got a result against OC. I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering now if Juan's trying to figure out where can I, who can I spark? Who can I light a fire under? Hell, having competition, having these guys back and just having a competition and training might, might be that type of spark that you need. Just, just knowing that you're, you're, you're playing for your job. It can, it can be a difference. I mean, it's one of those ones that goes one of two ways, isn't it? Either it really lights a fire under someone. They go, they really work hard and they're battling on the training ground every day. And then they get out there and you see them fighting to hold on to their position when they do get their minutes on the field, or it goes the other way and it ends up becoming discouraging to some people. And it's hard to tell how it's going to go sometimes until you actually see it happen. So for now, I, I mean, it's look bringing in more competition, definitely not a bad thing necessarily, especially if it's someone who you look at the numbers he's been putting up in loud and in terms of chance creation. And you think this is a guy who could definitely add something to this team, uh, but quite the, the real long-term and broader implications of that. We're really not going to know, are we, until probably a few weeks' time. No, because we we shouldn't even expect to see... So let's say the results do start turning around and Panos is the key. Do you? I don't expect to see it this weekend. No. Maybe you start seeing it next weekend, and then by July, you understand, okay, this is who they thought they were bringing in. But you're right. I, I don't think... You can't. You can't create team chemistry. It, it's impossible. You have to build it. It has to be earned. That you have to train together. You have to play together. That takes time. He didn't get the preseason, right? He's still learning what Juan wants to do. That isn't necessarily pounded into his head. He had, what, a day of training before he came on Saturday? And he was lost. He never really got on the ball. But that's honestly to be expected when you're a stranger amongst amongst your teammates. So, It'll be interesting to see if if Panos can be that guy when Quajo comes back. If Fede can try to find his form, that'll that'll be very interesting to see. Give in a month's time, I would love to just come back to this conversation and see where we're at. Indeed, it's it's going to be an interesting one. I mean, we'll see even again with with the week's training quite how Panos is looking in this team. Maybe just maybe we'll see something come by the weekend, a little bit better. Maybe I don't know. We'll. We'll have to see. But if they aren't better on the weekend, I'm sure some people are going to be going home and hitting on some of the OGs. Now, Jake, I know you're not a big beer guy, but I get a feeling that you may be more uh, comfortable with the OGs. Let's put it that way, yeah? We may have to uh, hook you up with some. Okay, let's do it. He's not going to say no. they got mixed bags now. They've got the fruit, so that's going to be watermelon, red apple, and peach. They've got the creams. Blackberries and cream, orange creamsicle, peaches and cream, and of course, Max making sure that he gets back in time for them to drop their new pink lemonade flavor coming on June 25th. Wow, that might have to be my first one. He's going to wait until the pink lemonade comes out and try the new flavor. And remember, you can check out OGs online at ogsbrands.com, as ogeezbrands.com, and on Instagram at ogsbrands. You can find their products at your local dispensary. And remember, of course, you must be 21 years or older to purchase. And of course, in the near future, at some point, we're going to have to find our way back to Valley Taproom for trivia on a Tuesday. Uh, that's actually going on right now. So one of these weeks, we're not going to have a Tuesday uh, show. And we're going to be able to bring you uh, down to trivia and have a good time down there. Because we won trivia last time I was down there with uh, Max. And he, of course, takes all the credit for that, as you would expect Max to do. He answered about two questions, I think. Um, maybe three, if I'm being generous. Uh, but it was Max that won it, apparently. Uh, but it's a great time down at Valley Tap Room. Lots of beers, 30 taps on, big wine selection, lots of other things to drink as well, not just in, on the tap, but also lots of bottles and cans. And you can bring food from next door as well. It's a great time down there in Gilbert. Make sure to check out Valley Tap Room. And uh, 
make sure to let them know that myself and Max sent you there. But uh, now, Jake, let's let's draw ourselves towards something of a conclusion now. But let's do so by looking around the rest of USL and looking maybe a little bit bigger picture as well. So the biggest story on Saturday night, New Mexico United lose 1-0 at home to El Paso Locomotive. Later that night, Zach Prince stepping down from his role at New Mexico as the head coach there. What was your reaction to that news, Jake? Yeah, I, I tweeted it out. It was either their expectations for this season were astronomically higher than any of us thought they were, or he has something else lined up. And I think it's the latter because I, there's it just makes no sense. It's way too early in the season to be firing coaches. They're they're arguably, I mean, not, not arguably, they are having a better season as as it stands in Phoenix. They're two points back with the game in hand and defeated them in the Open Cup. So by definition, they're having a better season. There's still 20-some games to go. But yeah. it, it just doesn't make sense to me because it's not like you were expecting them to be a top-four team, did you? Did anyone? No. I, I, I expected them to be mid-table, that. maybe creep, you know, fit. It, a good season would have been fourth place, third place in the West, right? And however long your playoff run goes, maybe. And New Mexico – even that the year we didn't have an open cup, right? They've always seemed to be an open cup team that, that, that they always do well in that competition. Um, whether it's just making the round of 32, you still made the round of 32 in the entire United States. That's still, in my opinion, an accomplishment because let's face it, Phoenix rising has failed to get out of that first round, even though it's the second round technically, but their, their first round multiple times in the last half decade and at the hands of New Mexico. So, the, the timing of it was weird. He's got to be going somewhere else, in my opinion. I, I'm not reporting that, but it, it just doesn't make any sense. Well, the chatter at the moment, of course, is all about the fact that he'll be off to join uh, his former boss in Troy Lezane up in New York. The Red Bulls, the assistant coach up there. Uh, we'll have to see if that indeed is how things pan out. The question then becomes which direction are New Mexico United going to turn to? And that's something that, of course, we saw a particular rumors account uh, on Twitter posting a couple of names out there, two of which uh, in Rick Chance and Richard Chaplo, I think we can very safely rule out based on the conversations that I've heard at least. They're uh, definitely not pointing in that direction. Let's put it that way. Um, of course, though, I mean, are, are you expecting maybe that it's going to be someone completely unknown to us in the USL sphere? I, I don't really know any big names that would take over uh especially at, at this point unless you're really going to invest into the new mexico project which if for those that don't follow everything that happens in albuquerque it's not really going necessarily well for them so it it i don't i don't want to call them a lame duck team it's kind of harsh but it, it it's a tough job because i and i think the fact that zach prince left tells you all you need to know i mean he started the team he he was there from the very beginning, and now he's leaving his own baby, so to speak. It might be the assistant interim just holds on. You might get someone who has been retired maybe for a while and wants to give it a go, who has some USL experience. But I I don't think it's you're going to get a big name. It just doesn't fit the team at all. Mm, I, I tend to tend to agree with you there. I don't think it's going to be someone who is well-known in USL circles, but it could well be someone very qualified. There are candidates out there um, that have a lot of experience in football and at high levels of football, even if it's not in the professional game. And it'll be interesting to see quite which direction they choose to go in. Of course, New Mexico, a team that have prioritized their kind of community image and all of that. Um yeah, I, I just don't see some of the candidates that have been thrown out there, the names that have been thrown out there being a particularly good match. And, and people both around USL and in some in, in New Mexico as well, not necessarily seeming that to, to think that they're going to go down that line either. So uh, I think it's relatively safe to say that while it would probably be quite amusing to see what happened if Rick Chance was given that job in particular, um, I don't foresee that being the case but let's look around at some of the other kind of notable incidents from the weekend anyway of course when we spoke uh 
Jake last. I believe it was 3 0 to San Antonio with that game ending 3 yeah. all. Uh, thanks to goals in the 75th, 79th, and 95th minute for San Diego Loyal after San Antonio had a player sent off in the first half. One that's caused a lot of bad blood since. Um, Definitely an incident that very much could have been a red card uh, for San Diego much earlier in the game. Happening right in front of the benches, resulted in a mass confrontation. No red card was given. There have been other allegations. After the game, Nate Miller came out and said that San Diego players had been, you know, they'd been punched, spat at, all of these kind of things by San Antonio players. I mean, these are quite serious accusations to start just throwing around, aren't they? Well, punched and spat at, there's... Three officials literally on the pitch, a fourth that's just to the side. I mean, how does how do none of them see it once? Because it, well, we haven't seen any on the footage either. So I mean, it's like, it, it's incre it's incredible if it is true. But like, I mean, I mean, Luis Suarez did get away with biting Giorgio Chiellini in a match. But I mean, even the other team saw it, and the other team knew. The referee. I, it, when you're saying players are punching you and spitting on you, I just don't know how that can go unseen by an entire refereeing. If you tell the officials it's happening over the course of a game, I mean, hell, it, it, it could have happened maybe once, but I don't know if, if it's going to be happening continuously throughout a match. I just don't see how it's possible. But again, with USL, man, like nothing surprises me anymore with this league. <laughs> Nothing does, nothing does. I mean, it's worth remembering, of course, that this, there's been a little bit of bad blood, I think, between San Diego and San Antonio ever since they first met in the playoffs um, a few years back. And the comment came from Landon Donovan that time about how San Antonio were like this team that, oh, they're very physical. Uh, they're not really a footballing team. It's effectively what he was saying. He was pretty much just saying they go out there and kick their opponents and, and somehow win games. That was effectively what Landon Donovan was saying before a playoff game. And of course, San Diego lose that game because you're writing your opposition's team talk for them. But it's just, I mean, I think we've seen that heat up. We've seen in the past as well. And look, I can't tell you for certain what has happened here with the San Antonio players, the San Diego players. We do know that Nate Miller, uh, according to what we've been told for a while now, is one of those guys who, on the San Diego bench, played a role in complaining to the officials at the time that J.J. Williams was sent off for Phoenix Rising last time they traveled to San Diego. Um, back when J.J. Williams was with the team, he was one of the guys on the bench claiming that J.J. had thrown a water bottle at the crowd when he had, in fact, thrown it at a wall nowhere near the crowd, and J.J. was sent off, later overturned by the league. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm not sure whether I truly believe his claims or not. Um, but it is still quite an allegation to go and throw out. I mean, if it's true, I hope there is video footage that the league have access to and they can go and, and deal with it appropriately at a later time. But then again, it's also USL Championship, so I'm not necessarily holding my breath on that one. Um, I'll put it this way. If there's one team that I said cries wolf the most, complains the, the most... I don't think there's any argument as to who we would all say. <laughs> it's just kind of been San Diego's MO since they've joined the league. I, I, I don't know if that's from the and top down. And some of it's justified, some of it's not. Yeah. But yeah, it's... so like And, that, and that, it is almost the, the boy who cried wolf. Like At one point, a wolf did come in the story. There are times where they are justifiably complaining. But there are other times where, yeah, the, the, the complaining or the the build up or the, the 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 foundation of this is what we're going to complain about so we're going to complain about it before the game and then no matter what happens we're going to still complain about it after cuz i mean it, 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 take take the junior flemings incident aside which happened in 2020 there has now been two full seasons since that match happened and i still remember the date of that match it was in september like it i'll never forget that night no i don't think any of us will who covered the team at that point it was but San Diego has continued mm -hmm. to do that throughout their entirety. I, I don't watch every San Diego match. I, I, I watch games where if they're if it's with them versus a big team or when they're playing Phoenix or if you know they're the game of the day on a Friday or a Wednesday. But it's 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 they play the style of they're not 
They're not a physical team. I know Domus helps a lot now this year. But they like to pass it around you. They like to play a beautiful game, I will say. But you leave yourself susceptible to teams who are like, okay, well, you want to pass it around us. We're going to make you feel every pass that you make. It's just this, it's just part of the game. It's literally the – if you're a possession team, you're vulnerable on the counter. It's just part of the game. It, it It's a style that they have just always been known for. And I think it's one of those things now where it's just like, oh, San Diego, they're complaining again. And, it, and it, I don't want to dismiss it and say everything they're saying is false because at times they have been true. But it, it seems like it's always something with them. It's never a quiet time in San no. Diego, is it, around that team? But And now they have an MLS team that they got to deal with, so <laughs> that's another one. Even there, more drama, even more drama there. in San Diego. Always drama in San Diego. Sometimes you look at it and just think, we complain about Phoenix. I suppose it could be worse. But anyway, let's look at some of the other games coming up. There's a game tomorrow afternoon, 4.30, Charleston Battery against Detroit City FC. Can Detroit kind of keep their uh, little rebound going, do you think, against Charleston? I don't know because they're not at home. Detroit at home is – they have a great, great fan base. I, I love watching the games in Detroit in the, in the short time that they've been in USL championship. Um, I don't know, man. Charleston's tough to play, and it's getting hot. So it's going to be humid. Not that it's not hot and sticky in Detroit. Um but we saw Rising go to Charleston, and it uh, it was tough. Um, Not ideal, no. We'll see. It, it, it Detroit's been shocking me, but again, all of it's been happening in in Motown. So let's let's see what they can do on the road. We will have to see. But of course, there's also Open Cup this week. Uh, Pittsburgh Riverhounds fell three one earlier today to FC Cincinnati. I thought they were a bit unlucky there. I felt as though a little bit of a hint of offside around that first goal from Brandon, Brandon Vasquez in the. 56th minute for Cincinnati. And, uh, of course, that goal going in changes the game, right? You've got to open up a little bit more. You've got to chase the equalizer yourself, which leaves you susceptible to conceding more. They do concede in the 71st minute then and the 92nd for pulling back a consolation goal late. But that's that's unfortunate for me because I do think there was a, definitely a little bit of a hint of offside around that one goal. But there's another game coming up now with the USL team, Birmingham Legion FC facing into Miami who recently parted ways with their coach. Is that a possibility, perhaps, to get a USL team into the semifinal again? So it's interesting. The data usually shows that a team that has a coaching change, the first few matches tend to not necessarily be bad results. But again, I, I, don't, know how, I don't know how serious you're going to take the Open Cup. We've seen mm-hmm. teams just not care about it. like just the whole time not care. But you're at this point, you're, you've gotten this far, right? We've you're in the quarterfinals. About... If you're doing badly enough to yeah. sack your coach in the league, this is a great chance to turn around and just make a, you know, make, make a statement and that you can actually still recover something from this year. You're actually making up for it a little bit. If you've got to write off the league season, win the cup. You've done something this year. And we've we've talked about it too. It's it's even if you don't care about the competition, once you get to a certain point, you go, "Hey, well, we made it this far. We might as well try to win it." That would be what I would expect out of that. And just to go back to the Pittsburgh match, I like to remind people: for as much as people complain about VAR and not having it, or how much they dislike it, this is what VAR would prevent. Yeah. These goals that are you could say you could just on a replay go yeah he's off, and it changes a whole game. It ends a team's cup run. They might have still lost. Who knows? But goals change games because you have to then play out more and leave yourself more susceptible. So I, I like to go back and say, for as much as people hate replay, you'll hate it even more not having it. And today was the perfect example of why. Jake, have you finally then managed to get over your uh, hump from VAR from last week? Or My, that that's a little different. That one's more each league <laughs> officiates differently. Like that's a penalty in Italy, and the letter of the law might say otherwise. But in Italy, if it hits your hand, it's a penalty. And so you're, I, I, and I do not. I I completely am against the, the Roma's reactions on referee Anthony Taylor. 
in the airport, especially. It's ridiculous. Like, the game's over, guys. Like, his wife is there. Leave him alone. But I understand the frustration because a foul in England or a penalty in England, or sorry, a foul in Italy, a penalty in Italy may not be in England. And that's what happened on that particular day. Hey, yeah. Roma scored both goals in that match. <laughs> Oh, Jake. I feel like we could we could speak for a while about that one. Um, it's probably still a slightly sore subject for you, is it, at this point? Josie's staying, and I think Dybala might be staying too. So looking, <laughs> looking at the positives. We're in the Europa League again. Take the positives. Take the positives for now. Well. We were five we'll... minutes away from another conference league season. That would have been, a, would, that would have been <laughs> ten times worse. All right. Well, that's about bringing us towards our conclusion for the day. I will say this, though. For those of you who haven't yet picked up your PHNX Rising merchandise, remember, you can do so at the PHNX Locker. PH... I'll eventually stop tripping over my words. PHNXLocker.com. Uh, you can find T-shirts, PHNX Rising, the scarf, which remarkably is very light, um, despite the fact that it's summer. It's a very light scarf, so can still get some use out of that. And Good of course, for wiping sweat away. That's very true. As producer Leah, they're hopping in, telling it's, us it's a nice fabric for. It's good for summer. Yeah, it is for a rising match. It is indeed, uh, especially if you're getting those uh, dollar beers all over you later in the season. When hopefully we see a few more goals on those nights, maybe. Help you just kind of wipe it up a little bit and look good while you're doing so. But of course, there's a lot of other uh, good gear on there as well. We've got our Yote stuff, Suns, D-backs, Cardinals, all of that on there. So make sure to check that out at the PHNX Locker, phnxlocker.com. And of course, make sure to tune in on Thursday, 6 p.m. Jake, unfortunately, you'll not be with me on that one, but I will be joined by Ryan Sakura on Thursday here in the studio. So you know where to look, you know when to look now. It's our usual Thursday at six. Until then, uh, well, I will say actually, though, Jake, thank you for joining. Actually, you've done two of these now. Yeah, two in what, like three days. I love two it. Two in three days. There we go. He's you're, you're almost becoming a fixture here now. Yeah, we we'll should, get we you should in make, the studio we, soon. We we'll it. get you in the studio <laughs> soon. All right, well, Thursday at 6. Until then, goodbye. Go. Oh.